Welcome to this edition of Iowa Stories, our new title for our lecture series. I have a few preliminaries to get out of the way before we get to the main event, so um, bear with me here. I want to first of all thank Ty Coleman and his crew from the Iowa City Government Channel 4 for covering this event, um, and it will be broadcast later on the internet for those of you who want to see it again. <laughs> I want to thank Charles Scott for his technical assistance and for digitizing excerpts from our KCRG TV news film collection that you're going to see in a little bit. Um, Sharon's research into this topic was made possible in part due to the efforts of a couple of former State Historical Society staff members, Matt Schaefer and Duncan Stewart. Matt's here today. Um, they That's collected right. papers and oral histories from some of Iowa's leading political activists. Um, a number of people involved in the story that Sharon's going to tell in a little bit are here. Um, we know at least of uh, F Bill Douglas, Frank Cordero, Gene Hagen, Jeffrey Morgan, Skip Leitner, Sue Futrell. Um, Sharon will be introducing them later, but we want to welcome all of you. And some of those people contributed papers to the collection that, that Sharon was able to use to, to put this story together. We hope you'll want to join us for more of our Iowa Stories programs later this spring. Um, if you want to hear about those um, directly from us, give us your email and we'll, we'll uh, get you on a list to let you know. Um, in particular, I want to mention that on March 14th, University of Iowa professor Marion Wilson Kimber will tell the story of Iowa women's clubs and the promotion of Iowa composers. Uh, Marion Wilson Kimber teaches musicology here at the University of Iowa and she'll discuss why local music clubs across Iowa, especially women's clubs, enthusiastically promoted and performed music by Iowa composers from the 1920s to the 1940s. Okay, that's the preliminaries. And I want to introduce Sharon to you. Sharon Lake, uh, for those of you who don't know, and a lot of you out here I know do know her, um, earned a PhD in American Studies from the University of Iowa in 2010. Her research focuses on the role of local activists in creating social change. She is in the process of revising her dissertation for publication. That was a study of um, Iowa's breastfeeding firefighter and the national struggle for workplace equity, a case study of Iowa's first woman firefighter. Iowa City's first woman firefighter. In her non-academic life, she organizes grassroots partisan political efforts in her neighborhood on the east side of Iowa City, and she still has her day job with a company in Kelowna, Iowa that supports family, small family farms. Her talk today is based on the same research that went into her article in the fall 2018 issue of the Annals of Iowa. <laughs> oh, no! <laughs> There we go, and Bill's holding up. Yeah. Um, I have been, at, my name is Marvin Bergman, I introduced myself. Um, I edit this journal and have been editing it for more than 30 years. <laughs> um, so that's like 120, more than 120 issues. This is my favorite all time cover. <laughs> so Sharon's only got about half an hour, 40 minutes today, so if you want the rest of the story, as Paul Harvey used to say, those of you old enough to remember who that is, um, you, uh, we'll have copies of this issue available for sale after the talk and a special price of five bucks for anybody who wants one. Um, I should also mention that Sharon's research for this topic was um, made available, made, partly made possible by a, I mean, she did a lot of this search <coughs> long ago, but she brought it up to date um, with a, research grant from the State Historical Society, and those are funded by the State Historical Society Incorporated. I think that's all I need to say. Welcome, Sharon. Okay, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I messed up my papers now. Thank you, Marv, for the introduction, and thank you to the State Historical Society for holding these, this series and for inviting me here today, and thank you to all of you for coming today. Thank goodness we didn't have a snowstorm. I was worried about that. Um, Marv, I have to make the comment, since, since you talked about this picture, this picture is the sheriff of uh, Lynn County standing uh, in front of the line when the protesters were, were arrested. And when, the, um, when they showed this picture in the courtroom uh, towards the end of the trial, the, uh, 
the jury couldn't help noticing that the judge could not stifle himself and he like laughed <laughs> when he saw <laughs> when he saw the sheriff in his cowboy hat and a, we're not saying that's why they were acquitted, but just saying. Um, for those of you who haven't discovered yet, there's cookies in the hallway. There's chocolate chip cookies, and there's 13 no nukes cookies for those special 13 people. Um, so stay, you're welcome to have them anytime you want and afterwards. So the research for this article started in a graduate course that I took many years ago entitled American Legal History. So our assignment was to find a legal case and to put it in historical context. So we were interrogating the relationship between law and society. And we were asked specifically to look at that relationship and the factors involved in how law and society interact with each other, to get specific about it. So I chose the case of the Palo 13. One reason, I knew nobody else had done it and nobody else was likely to do it. Um, but the trial and the acquittal, especially the fact that they were acquitted, makes it a very interesting story. So I, I picked up that case, which occurred in 1979, and, and made that my case study for the class. That's how it all started. So I want to introduce the case to you today and set the stage with a news clip, like Marv mentioned. We're going to hope the technology all works well. So this is a news clip that aired on March 24th, 1979, which was the day that the protesters were arrested. This isn't the first confrontation here between the law and the anti-nuclear power group, the Iowa Mobilization for Survival. As for the Dwayne Arnold Center, it went back online just two weeks ago after a nine-month shutdown for repairs. But the protesters made it plain today, a temporary shutdown is not enough. This plant should not be allowed to reopen now or ever by blocking the main entrance. We are asking the Iowa Electric Light and Power Company to cease the operation of this dangerous plant for us and for our children's children. Yeah. Iowa Electric has placed this barricade here to prevent unauthorized persons from entering upon Iowa Electric's property. Proceeding past this barrier will constitute an act of trespass for which you can and will be arrested. After that warning, 13 of the group in all crossed the barricade. One by one, they were carried away by Lynn County Sheriff's deputies charged with illegal trespass. And this isn't the last of the protests. The anti-nuclear coalition says it's going to organize another rally here late next month. From the Duane Arnold Energy Center near Palo, Kevin Kendall, TV9 Eyewitness News. Okay, so the 13 people who were arrested that day were found not guilty, although they themselves fully expected to be convicted. All the evidence would also suggest that they would be convicted. First, there had been thousands of protesters arrested at nuclear power plants around the country prior to their arrest, and all of them had been found either guilty or not guilty on a technical reason, such as failure to, um, failure to prove that they were actually on utility property when they were arrested, or failure to file the papers in time. But the Palo 13 agreed that they had broken the law and they were not seeking a technical defense. Secondly, while Iowa law does permit trespassing with justification, the jury did not hear any testimony about the dangers of nuclear power. So what justification could they have had? What persuaded the jury that they were justified in Trans trespassing on the Dwayne Arnold facility, when all the other judges and juries who had heard similar cases had come to a different conclusion. So the purpose of my research was to answer that question. And I concluded that the social and political factors surrounding the context of the case can account for this verdict. So before I present the details of the trial, let's, let me give you a little bit of context of what led up to these 13 people being at the you know, crossing the line at the nuclear power plant. The anti-nuclear movement developed in Iowa, as it did across the country, in two distinct overlapping phases. During the first phase, opponents of nuclear power worked through regulatory and legislative processes to oppose the construction and the licensing of nuclear power plants. As you can guess, that didn't always work. <laughs> and when it didn't, 
uh, a new wave of, of nuclear opponents joined the fight. And they used direct action tactics. That was what characterized the second wave. Protests, rallies, site occupations. So in Iowa, the first phase of the anti-nuclear movement begins in the early 1970s, after Iowa Electric had begun construction of the first and only nuclear power plant in Iowa, the Dwayne Arnold Energy Center in Palo. The building permit was granted in 1969 with very little fanfare, very little objection. However, by 1973, when it was time for them to get their operating license, they had to go and in front of another commission and get an operating license. By that time, the co-chair of a relatively new organization in Iowa City called the Citizens for Environmental Action filed a petition to intervene. And he pointed out in his petition that there were questions about safety, there were questions about necessity, there were questions about environmental hazards, all of which should be answered before this plant was allowed to go online. Well, he was laughed out of the room, so to speak, and the license was granted and the plant was fully operational by early 1975. But this planted the seed for the folks who wanted to oppose things on that environmental side to get together. They were determined they didn't want any more plants to be built in Iowa, and they knew that part of the reason Dwayne Arnold had been built was because there was no opposition early on. So several small environmental groups banded together and started to work actively through those legislative and regulatory channels to prevent the construction of any further nuclear power plants in Iowa, which we have never had, and we can credit them partly <laughs> for that. The direct action branch of Iowa's anti-nuclear movement began developing in 1977, largely through their creation of a statewide chapter of the Mobilization for Survival. This was a national organization with four main goals, end nuclear power, and nuclear weapons, ban the arms race, and fund human needs. So those are the four central goals. So the Iowa mobilization provided a structure for all the local peace and social justice groups around the state to coordinate their activities and to resist nuclear power through that, through that channel. The members of two groups in particular, the Iowa Socialist Party, and the Catholic Worker Movement took very active roles in the Iowa Mobilization for Survival. And most of the 10 men and, thir and three women, so the 13 was 10 men and three women, most of them belonged to or were associated with one or both of those two organizations. Iowa's nuclear, anti-nuclear activists did participate in demonstrations and direct action around the country. But, of course, their focus was on the Dwayne Arnold plant to get that shut down. Since the plant had come online in 1975, there had been some minor problems and some minor shutdowns. But in the spring of 1978, it faced a very serious situation. Cracks were discovered in several pipes. One of them, 75% of the circumference, was cracked. The repair process proved very lengthy and challenging. They mentioned in the video it was closed for nine months. <coughs> they thought it was going to be closed for two weeks. But the problem was it was the kind of a um, problem that they had not anticipated. There was no protocol for addressing it. The pipes were in a highly radioactive area of the plant, so the people could only work in there for short stretches at a time. The Nuclear Regulatory Commission at the time called it the most serious plant pr problem that they had seen at a commercial reactor. So complaints then start to emerge, both inside and outside the plant, that the repairs are not being done properly. An investigation is called by the NRC, Nuclear Regulatory Commission, and they, cited, they, they, they reported publicly on their findings, and they chastised the plant and told them that they had numerous violations, including failure to train the welders adequately. The local newspaper fear reported that sabotage was suspected at the plant, and workers were required to take lie detector tests. So it was a hot mess, is what I'm saying. <laughs> when, and there's more, and there's more. When the welds were finally completed, 
the verifying agency's engineers, they had a team of four, they could not agree on whether they were safe or not. Do you want to guess what they did? <laughs> It'll be very reassuring. They said, well, Dwayne Arnold, plant, send your engineers, convince us that they're safe, which they did, and they did. <laughs> so the plant reopened uh, in March of, of 1979. And that's when the Mobilization for Survival group decided, OK, we're enough is enough. They're reopening on these shaky grounds, and we're going to do something more dramatic. We're, it's time for civil disobedience at the plant. So I'll switch a little more now to the trial, to, to after, they were, um, after they were arrested. So the Palo 13 shared the approach to creating change that social scientist Barbara Epstein has documented in her studies of nonviolent direct action movements of the 1970s and 80s. And what she has said about it is this. Direct action is as much about a particular social vision and the practice of community building as it is about the particular issue that it's taking on. That was something that characterized how the Palo 13, along with the much wider national nonviolent direct action movements were approaching things. And for that reason, there were a couple of um, factors that characterized them. In particular, they were very self-consciously nonviolent. That was a part of being the movement. And also non-hierarchical. This meant that a con commitment to consensus was at the heart of how the Palo 13 made their decisions. And this meant it could be difficult for a lawyer to, to try to corral these people into a courtroom and present a coherent case. But the right person for the job showed up. Um, Jack Cagle first came to Iowa in the mid-1960s. Jack's not here today. I regret that, but he's, he's up in Minnesota. He came to Iowa in the mid-1960s as a student at Simpson College. After graduation, he applied to the Peace Corps, but he was not accepted. He was drafted but, and served in Germany. After he was released from the service, he went to law school in his home state of Illinois, and he worked for a few years in the public defender's office. He reported to me that he had worked on a particularly difficult and gut-wrenching capital punishment case, and he just decided he had to shift the focus of his practice. And that's when he got an offer to come to Iowa to work as counsel on, for an environmental group. And so he, he took that chance, and he came. So, he was of the same generation as the Palo 13, and he understood their beliefs. I'm not saying he shared them all, but he understood them. He put his heart into their case, and he had the kind of courtroom experience that made him an effective advocate within the legal system. And as one defendant put it, Jack was able to incorporate our most esoteric torturings of thought and language <laughs> into a coherent and unified defense. <laughs> Through the lengthy pretrial strategy sessions, and I say lengthy because, remember, consensus, the group agreed that they wanted to put nuclear power on trial. They wanted to explain why they believed that nuclear power was dangerous, and they wanted to argue in a court of law that their actions were justified. So in light of the Three Mile Island accident, which had stunned the nation just four days after they'd been arrested, helped. it helped. <laughs> they, thought they, they thought they might get a... They, you, you guys shouldn't have made that happen. They thought the jury might be receptive to hearing about the dangers of nuclear power. <laughs> the coverage of the events at Three Mile Island were widespread. It was on the front page of the Cedar Rapids Gazette for five days in a row. And the accident demonstrated to Americans that a, an accident could occur, and more importantly, that the ability of the plant's owners or the government to manage the accident was very much in question. <laughs> it did not uh, promote confidence. So although they weren't sure if the judge would let them present this defense, if the judge would let them talk about the dangers of nuclear power, that was plan A. Plan A is, this is our defense. So the trial starts. It's not business as usual, however, at that Lynn County Courthouse on June 19th, which was a Tuesday, the first day of the trial. Number one, the defendant's table was crowded with 12 people. 
one, one of the defendants had become ill and, and his case was separated from the rest. So there was 12 of them moving forward. 12 people at a defendant's table, usually there's one. Secondly, refer back to consensus. The process of choosing the jury was done by the whole team. <laughs> this meant it took all day to seat a six-person jury in a civil, civil case, right? Criminal trespass. So it took all day. And lastly, several of the defendants had told their attorney that they did not want to rise for the judge. So arrangements had been made that several of the defendants were escorted into the courtroom after the judge had already come into the, into the room and taken his seat. So they were fortunate, and they realized it, uh, to have had their case assigned to Judge Thomas Keeler. He had a reputation for being more open and tolerant than other judges, as we can already see. Um, Jack Cagle appreciated very much that he worked with them to for an arrangement that would avoid contempt of court charges. Because if they didn't rise for the judge, it was, it was just going to be contempt of court over, like it was just really going to stall things out. So Judge Keeler was kind enough to work with them on a, on a system to circumvent that. Um, and he also pointed out to me, Jack did later in talking about it, that, he, that, he, that the judge never showed what he would call any bias against the defendants um, for, because of their beliefs or because of their behavior, he treated them with with, with respect. And this kind of said something to the jury about, about their need to give respect to the defendants. So they thought they, they, it, was a good, it was a good draw that they got to get um, Thomas Keeler as their judge. So then on Wednesday, the next day, the jury is now chosen and the trial gets underway. Although, not before one more departure from usual courtroom procedure, the defendants rose for the jury when the jury came in. Um, <laughs> we were very aware that the jury would decide, and we wanted them to know that we respected them, one of the defendants explained. Once everyone was seated, the assistant prosecutor, Kevin Shea, he was new on the job, he presented the case. He presented it, uh, his strategy was very straightforward. They trespassed, they were told not to, they're guilty. However, unfortunately for Kevin, the witnesses failed his witnesses. So he had, the woman that you saw in the video with the red hair, she was one of his witnesses. She worked for the power company. Um, and of course, some of the deputies who had arrested um, the team. They failed to prove conclusively that the defendants had been on utility property when they were arrested. <laughs> and they misidentified two of the defendants. <laughs> Very humorous exchange that was documented in one of the newspapers. Um, Made the, made the witness look somewhat foolish. So by lunchtime, Jack Cagle was thinking, Let's, I'm going to move to dismiss. They haven't proven their case. But he conferred, consensus style, with all of the defendants. And they were like, oh, no, we're not doing that. We want our chance. We want to get up there. We want to, we want to say what's happened. So, so they move on. And after lunch, the first defense witness is called Sue Futrell of Iowa City. Now, Sue had participated in the 1977 historic occupation of the Seabrook power plant, along with 14 other, 1,400, 1,400 other people. She was arrested and spent two weeks in the Dover Armory in the custody of the state of New Hampshire. That experience had a profound effect on her and inspired her to deepen her involvement in the movement. She attended a week-long Train the Trainer course to learn how to prepare individuals who wish to participate in civil disobedience. On the stand, Futrell was a young, clean-cut woman. She described the civil disobedience training that she had provided. She explained nonviolent direct action as a carefully chosen, well-thought-out strategy that involved a deep commitment to values such as personal responsibility and respect for others. Most people who talked about her testimony thought she made a very favorable impression on the jury. The first defendant called to the stand was Frank Cordero, the energetic and charismatic and tireless pillar of the Des Moines Catholic Worker House. After graduating from UNI in 1973, Cordero had entered the seminary to explore the idea of becoming a priest. The following summer, he worked in an African-American and Puerto Rican parish in the South Bronx, which he later said, changed my whole life. I came to the conclusion 
that if the only poor people in the world existed in the Bronx, that's too many. And because I'm a gospel person, I'm going to spend the rest of my life trying to address those issues. Cordero lived in a Catholic worker house the following summer, and he found his calling. With a friend, they opened the first Catholic worker house in Des Moines in the fall of 1976, which is still there. Direct action is at the heart of the Catholic worker movement which responds to the biblical teachings of Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount to perform the corporal works of mercy. For me, Cordero explained, direct action is a faith language. Inspired by the Berrigan brothers, he was arrested for spilling his blood on the pillars of the Pentagon and for trespassing at the Rocky Flats Plutonium facility in Colorado and served short jail terms for both of those. On the stand, Cordero asked, answered several general opening questions, who he was, did he go to Palo, yes he did, and then Jack asked him, why? Why did you trespass at the nuclear power plant? And when he began to answer by, by talking about the dangers of radiation, the prosecution objected. The prosecution claimed that this was irrelevant, was not material, should not be allowed. So now the moment of truth was at hand. And to their great disappointment, the judge sustained the prosecutor's objection. But Jack had prepared for this, and he had plan B. The defendants, he argued, should be allowed to present testimony that would shed light on their state of mind, because that, he said, was a relevant factor in assessing their justification. This time he had more luck, and the judge agreed. So this ruling allowed the jury to hear testimony about the defendant's previous attempts to voice um, their concerns about nuclear power, and also to hear about the beliefs and the feelings that they had when they sat down to block the, nuclear power, the entrance to the nuclear power plant. They could not, however, hear any testimony about the general dangers of nuclear power or the specific problems at the Palo plant. So then we're on to day three. Two expert witnesses are called. Skip Leitner of the Community Action Research Group testified about the nuclear industry's disregard for the environment. And Dr. George Bedell of the University of Iowa Medical School testified about the dangers of radiation to human health. The jury had to leave, of course. They couldn't hear that. But they were there long enough to hear them sworn in, what their credentials were, so they knew what they were going to be talking about. I should also add that the defendants did give testimony about the dangers of nuclear power, but the jury had to leave the room each time. So each time they left the room, all the defendants stood up for the jury, and each time they came back, they all stood up. So there was lots of standing and, standing and sitting throughout these two days of testimony. The day three ended with the testimony of Steve Marston, one of Iowa's most relentless activists, and the Palo 13 defendant with the longest history of participating in nonviolent direct, uh, non direct action. Steve was raised in Eldora, Iowa, and he was the oldest defendant at age 31. <laughs> you thought that something different, maybe? His active, his active the youngest was, was 19, and that was Joe Patak. He was an undergrad here, so that, that was the span. Most of them were in their 20s. Um, Marston's activism was rooted in his Methodist faith, and he was spurred by the civil rights and free speech movements of the early 60s. His first arrest was in 1967, and his second was in 1971, both in protests against the Vietnam War. In 1972, he was arrested for draft resistance and received a three-year suspended sentence. Due to his subsequent tax resistance activity, his suspension was revoked, and he served nine months in a federal penitentiary. After his release from prison, Marston helped organize the Midwest route of the 1976 Continental Walk for Disarmament and Social Justice. It was on that walk that he met Frank, I think met Gene there. So the walk was very key to, to different activists in Iowa getting to meet each other. When the walk was over, Marston settled in Ames, Iowa, and played a key role in launching Free Flowing, an alternative newspaper for Iowa. He had ties with nearly every social activist group in the state, but his main affiliation during this time was with the Iowa Socialist Party. Founded in the early part of the 20th century, the Iowa Socialist Party had been dormant for many years until Bill Douglas 
a graduate student in history, I might add, <laughs> at the University of Iowa, reinvigorated the organization in the late 1970s. Yes. Under his leadership, the ISP built a small but active statewide organization that used nonviolent direct action as a protest strategy. Marston participated in two civil disobedience actions with other ISP members, including uh, getting arrested at Rocky Flats, and also in, uh, they, were, uh, they did a protest against inhumane prison conditions down at the Federal Bureau of Prison in St. Louis. So by the end of Friday morning, the jury had heard testimony from all 12 defendants regarding their personal background, their previous anti-nuclear work, and their thoughts and feelings when they sat down on the road to, to block the plant. One defendant told the jury that she felt a responsibility to protect the earth. Another compared her actions to those of the Old Testament prophet Ezekiel, who said that a prophet's role is to warn people of impending danger. Feminist and ISP member Jean Hagen, a native of Mason City, Iowa, offered a broad view of her personal motivations and influences. Hagen spoke about her experiences on the Continental Walk, about the time she had spent with Catholic worker founder Dorothy Day in upstate New York, about her reading of Gandhi, and about her understanding of nonviolence. In sum, Hagen told the jury, as far as she was concerned, Dwayne Arnold was trespassing on our lives. Yeah. <laughs> Before the defense rested, they played a short video um, showing the civil disobedience action. There had been a um, disagreement about showing the video and uh, the, the attorneys had to speak in chambers with the judge about it because the beginning of the video, on the beginning of the video, the deputies can be heard using vulgar language and making derogatory comments about the protesters. So of course the prosecutor wanted to you know, eliminate that part of it, but Judge, Judge Keeler allowed the jury to see the whole video. And, and Jack thought that the, as he put it, the coarse language of law enforcement was quite a contrast to the dignified conduct of the, of the defendants. By all accounts, Jack's closing argument was nothing short of brilliant. It brought tears to the eyes of the court reporter, members of the jury, and several of the defendants. Scott, defendant Scott Morgan summarized it best. The tightness of his logic, the clarity of his thought, and the conviction with which he delivered it overpowered the jury. Cagle used a strategy that he had honed during his years in the public defender's office. Here's how he explained it to me. Despite the presumption of innocence, jurors are usually predisposed towards conviction in criminal cases. Using the jury instructions in the closing argument helps to neutralize this tendency. In this case, where the defendants had admitted to doing everything that they were charged with, I thought it was doubly important to show them how they would be following the law by voting for acquittal. Hence, Cagle prefaced several parts of his closing argument with the words, as his honor Judge Keeler will instruct you, da 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 da. He, dis you know, you made, he discussed all the ways that the jurors could assess the credibility of the defendants. He pointed to their reasonable and peaceful way in which they had planned and carried out their action. He reminded them of all the legal means the defendants has used. He alluded to Three Mile Island so that they would remember what had happened. Uh, he was careful about that, though, because he didn't want to get uh, in trouble for talking about it in his, in his closing argument. In his conclusion, Cagle reiterated to the jury that he's asking for an acquittal because of, not in spite of, the law. I submit to you that these defendants were engaged in the prevention of a crime. Those people had the courage, the foresight, and the integrity to put their bodies between the plant and us. In view of that, ladies and gentlemen, you take a look at the words without justification in those instructions, and I submit to you that the only possible verdict in this case is not guilty. Shea's closing, the prosecutor, in contrast, lacked both emotional impact and rhetorical eloquence. <laughs> Ignor <laughs> I'm taking Scott's word for that. <laughs> Ignoring the social and political context, he said the defendants trespassed, there's no justification, nuclear power is irrelevant. 
The jurors deliberated for an hour and a half, and they went home Friday evening without reaching a verdict. They reconvened Monday morning at 10, and by noon they told the judge they had a verdict. When the not guilty verdict was announced, the defendants leapt to their feet and gave the jury a standing ovation. <laughs> I really felt it was a victory for the jurors, said defendant Jean Hagen. They had the gumption to acquit us. I love that quote, Jean. So the unexpected verdict in the Palo 13 case demonstrates how social and political factors can influence legal outcomes. First, the judge who heard the case influenced the decision. His flexibility in accommodating the Palo 13's unorthodox courtroom behavior signaled to the jurors that they deserved respect. In addition, his ruling that the defendant's state of mind was relevant allowed the jurors to hear the testimony upon which they based their conclusions. In our hearts, we felt they did have justification, explained the jury forewoman. The defendants were peaceful. Their sincerity and their dedication to the cause was what we really looked at. We really felt that they believed they were saving lives. The timing of the accident at Three Mile Island, as, as was mentioned here earlier, was also a significant factor in the verdict. Um, in fact, the defense team, everybody I spoke to on the defense team thinks that's the most significant factor. The jury doesn't remember it that way. Um, she said they did not talk a lot about that in, the, in their deliberations, but it is hard to believe that it did not influence them quite a bit. Uh, the specific time period also shaped the verdict. As the jury forewoman told me, people were becoming more aware of things not being black and white. We were aware that the government wasn't always correct. This is the late 1970s, after the Vietnam War, after the Watergate cover-up, after the resignation of President Nixon. So Americans, even this jury, which was composed of white, middle class, Middle-aged Midwesterners no longer trusted the government as a matter of course. The, new, the issue of nuclear power had also become much more visible in Cedar Rapids since the arrest of the Palo 13 and the accident at Three Mile Island. On April 21st, the Iowa Mobilization for Survival sponsored the largest anti-nuclear rally to date in Iowa. Over 1,000 Iowans gathered in downtown Cedar Rapids and marched from the Green Square Park to the Iowa Electric Tower, demanding that the plant be closed. The broad cross-section of Iowans who participated in that rally demonstrated that the concerns about nuclear power were on the rise. Lastly, the attorney who, shaped, who, who handled the case, of course, also shaped its verdict. Jack's experience and passion to the task of defending the Palo 13 gave him a distinct advantage, for one thing, over the prosecutor. There was a, a clear contrast in their level of experience and their, and their passion for the case. But most significantly, in sharp contrast to the prosecution's strategy, which ignored the context of the case and focused on a narrow interpretation of the law, the defense team framed the civil disobedience of the defendants within its social context. Therefore, even though the prosecution succeeded in shifting the focus of the trial from the dangers of nuclear power to what the defendants did, the defense succeeded in shifting the focus from what they had done to why and how they had done it. Jack's strategy of having the defendants testify about their state of mind allowed the jury to adopt the defendant's perspective on their actions and to see that they were sincere, in his words, sincere, well-meaning, and dedicated people. When the jurors retired to deliberate, they sifted the evidence through the social and political lenses that gave it meaning, and they found that the defendants indeed had justification to trespass on the property of Dwayne Arnold Energy Center. Thank you. <laughs> We, do, we, we have time for questions, but before we do that, I wanted to do two things. One is I'd like to read the names of all 13, of the Palo 13, <clears throat> and then I do want to introduce the people in the audience. So these are in alphabetical order, um, and some of the defendants are here, so they could raise their hands at the time. 
and Frank, you're, you're the first one in alphabetical order. <laughs> Frank Cordero is here from Des Moines. I'm so pleased that you're here, Frank. <laughs> <clears throat> Lucia Driansky, who was uh, uh, with the Catholic Worker House. James Dubert. Jim was also with Catholic Worker. And a socialist. And a socialist, all right. He became a priest. And, Hell, I don't know where he's at now. Uh, he's in Iowa, I think. Oh, good for him. <laughs> Maggie Guilfoyle. Uh, Maggie's, Maggie was with the Socialist Party. Greg Green, who was also with Socialist. Greg has passed away since this. Jean Hagen is here. <laughs> Richard Kramer, who I do not do you know did you know Richard, Bill? Yeah, yeah. He was with the ISD. I think he's still teaching he's teaching now in Ames, which is his I, I still have I think you're Joe Marin, who was with ISP, and he's still here in Iowa City. Steve Marston, who I spoke about, and as if if you don't know, Steve passed away about two years ago. And I dedicated the piece to, to Steve. I had interviewed him once, and it was kind of disjointed. So I was getting ready to interview him again when he, when he passed away. So that was really sad. Um, Jeffrey Morgan is here. <laughs> and Jeffrey, you were kind of like loosely affiliated to the ISP. Would that be the fair way to say it? Affiliated was how I lived my life. <laughs> Scott Morgan, who was, 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 he was, I think, there's only one or two people who were not Iowans in this group, too. And Scott was one of them. He was from New York. And so he's an outlier uh, for that reason and also because we, we could not call him an ISP and we could not call him a Catholic worker. He was, he was what, a self-described provocateur <laughs> artiste. Um, yeah, and so he's, as far as we know, he's still in New York, but I, he's not well. I know that. Uh, Joe Patak was the youngest, and he was an undergraduate here at the U of I. He was also, I think the ISP was too middle of the road for him. <laughs> he was in the Revolutionary Student Brigade. Yeah. And then Jim Runyon, uh, who was with Catholic Worker. Right, so, those are, so I'm just so pleased that we had three. We have you know, Frank and Jean and Jeffrey are all here today, all of whom you know, sat interviews for me, shared artifacts, um, et cetera, et cetera, which was super helpful. Um, in writing this, obviously, you never take a, their word for it. You, know? <laughs> you have to verify. But it's a good starting point. Uh, the other people who had a role in the trial that are here includes Skip Leitner, who is here. And although I didn't name you in the beginning of it, you, also, you were the one who filed the petition to intervene. So Skip was the first one to get. To I persuaded Jack to come. And for, oh, you, yeah, you hired Jack over right. here. Yeah, good job. Yeah. <laughs> um, Sue Futrell is here. She still lives in Iowa City. Most of you know Sue. And of course, Bill Douglas, <laughs> who is a, also a historian of Iowa. Um, and thanks to also, um, you know, the uh, Bill and Frank and Scott all wrote lengthy, no, Scott's was lengthy. You guys was more concise, but you wrote summaries of the trial close to when it happened, and those were really helpful documents um, because you wrote them right after it happened. There's no transcript of the trial. The only transcript that's available uh, it was, was Jack's summation. I, I couldn't tell you why that survived, but when I went to Lynn County Courthouse and they pulled out the, uh, the uh, you know, folder on the case, there was just some, a few notes about blah 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 and then there was, there was Jack's summation in there. Um, so the, they, they, had, they had, of course, you know, taken, the court recorder had taken notes in case there was going to be an appeal, but there wasn't, and so those eventually get thrown away. So I, I did read somewhere then along the line that a, no, a number of people had asked for copies of the summation because it was so powerful. So maybe, I think maybe Jack paid to have it transcribed or something. Don't know. Um, so we've got some time, questions, and, and I think we're supposed to use the yes, microphone if, if we do question, that. Raise your hand. I need to bring you the mic. It won't amplify your voice, but it will make it so they can hear it on the broadcast. Uh, right. Sharon, um, since the jur jury is calling the shots here, I don't understand why the expert witnesses were really called in um, to speak. So two reasons. One is 
um, like, like Sue's testimony, none of it was about nuclear power. So they, could, they heard all of it. They heard all of Sue's testimony in terms of um, how they had prepared for it, et cetera, et cetera. The others, two reasons. One is in case there was an appeal, so it's in the record. In if they had been found guilty, they, may, they were probably planning to appeal. And in the case of an appeal, you, the whole record gets pulled out and looked at. So, so they're giving testimony in case of an appeal. Oh, okay. Yeah, and, and at the same time, I mean, Jack felt that, it, that just the fact that, they were, that those witnesses were there, that the jury knew that what their expertise was, what the subject of their was, that in his words, that made like a psychological impact on the jury. And you know, they knew they had to leave and they couldn't hear it, but they were like, hey, there's a doctor from the U of I in there talking about the dangers of, of radiation. <laughs> Maybe there's something to that. So those were, those were the reasons for having the expert witnesses. Uh, so why didn't the county appeal? I don't think they can't appeal. Oh, they could? No, they're the prosecutors. Uh -huh. They don't get two rounds. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness. <laughs> And I don't know, I mean, Jean, you could speak to how prepared you guys actually were, or Frank, how prepared you guys actually were to do a, an appeal if you'd been found guilty. I, I don't know, but somebody told me, and maybe it was Jack, I'm not sure, somebody told me the company did, uh, Alliant Energy did not want any more bad publicity. <laughs> uh -huh. I'm sure that's the case, yeah. Oh, did you she hear said that? The Alliant Energy didn't want any more bad publicity, which is why they wouldn't have wanted Yeah, the utility. So this got um, coverage in the in the local area. Sure. Did, you, did you look into any national coverage, or was there much, or did it have an impact on the national scale? There wasn't really national <laughs> coverage, except you know maybe like small things in the in the anti-nuclear press, which there was a vibrant press um, that would uh, put together bits and pieces of what was happening around the country and that would be dispersed. But I wouldn't say in the mainstream press that the, that the Palo 13 case was covered. Pilot took all the air out of yeah, right, yeah, darn them. No. <laughs> but I would say this in terms of the national that you asked about. The, na the, the movement is national because there's local everywhere. So, in that sense, having local actions happening everywhere is what makes it a national movement. I mean, if Seabrook had happened and nothing else, that's not really a national movement. You know, it's, it's national because there's all these small groups um, springing up. In the Midwest, uh, there was a big anti-nuclear conference, and I'm going to say 78 maybe, mm -hmm. and it was held in Louisville, Kentucky. There were probably 50 different groups from the Midwestern states represented at that conference. So groups had sprung up all over the place, usually to, uh, to work on the local plant that was in either in their community or in their state. So in that sense, you know, it's, it's part of the national. It's, it's, what's, it's, what's, it's what's feeding it from the bottom up and making it a national movement. I think I asked Sharon about this earlier, so I, it, I don't know how much you want to say about it, but it, when I read the article that you did, it reminded me of the other really interesting jury oh. case in Cedar Rapids, which was in federal court, that was the Wounded Knee um, defendants oh. who were t moved to Cedar Rapids, tried there, and also acquitted by oh. a Cedar Rapids jury, and that got tons of national coverage oh. as well as local. It was a couple years before. Mm, you know it was right about the same time. No, 75. Oh, okay. I, I was thinking okay, thanks. 75. So I guess I'm curious in your future research <laughs> um, or if when you were working on this you came across any writing or anything that would, would have started to look at why both of those unusual verdicts happened in Cedar Rapids. Well, as I, yeah, I don't need that, probably. As I told Sue, when I originally started the project, I didn't know how long it takes to research something, and I had intended to look at both of those cases. And actually, OK, actually, I had a bigger plan. I was also going to do the Mother's Day one. So I, I had three cases that I was going to do all three of them in three months, you know, <laughs> while I was a graduate student and teaching rhetoric and everything. <laughs> yes. OK, so I got as far as one. But, but, but you're right, because there were these, you know, there were these acquittals in Cedar Rapids and, 
and the the case of the of the native the native american case of from stemming from the leonard pelletier case um i don't know if everybody knows the case that that sue is talking about but there had been uh, a couple of murders of two fbi agents on uh the indian reservation i think it, it was on oh, which yeah which Pine Ridge, thank you, on Pine Ridge Reservation. And several Native Americans had been arrested for murder, and two of them were tried up in Cedar Rapids, and they were found not guilty. Leonard Peltier was found guilty, and he's still in jail. Um, and he still claims that he did not do it. So yes, I didn't get to that part. However, I know that you know Bill is also interested in that kind of phenomena of of what ha you know what happened there that made these two cases in Cedar Rapids where you would kind of expect that the jury pool would be not so inclined to to take the vantage point of the defendants mm -hmm. and I don't have an answer to that and I don't know if you have any insights on that bill My one speculation is that there were a lot of free-thinking checks who, who, who uh, had descendants who uh, didn't, didn't uh, believe in the government much. But that's kind of a stretch because it's odd. I, yeah, I'd have to agree. <laughs> I would have to agree. Oh, so Sharon, what was the Mother's Day? Oh, thing? I never heard of that. So this. The, so there was two more actions of civil disobedience at the Duane Arnold plant. The, this one was in March of 79. The following summer on Mother's Day, 13, ah, was it 12, was it 14? Something like that. I'm looking at Jesse because I'm thinking, I'm, I thought that you might know, but, but I'm forgetting. You, no, because I was thinking you were one of them, but you weren't. No, Jean was. Well, anyhow, 12, 13, 14 women decided on Mother's Day to take that opportunity to, to commit civil disobedience at, at the Palo plant, kind of connecting it to, you know, to care for the earth and the earth is our mother theme. They were, what happened to them was they were arrested, but then they, they released them without charging them. And I think that that goes to what somebody said of, of, of the utility company not wanting the bad publicity. And wasn't that also because, because I was there in, in support. Yep. And what I remember, and Gene, correct me if I'm wrong, but um, it, they, they crossed the line, but then they went right back. They, they did. They, I mean, I can remember, I remember because you guys were in like in a circle, they planted a rose bush, right. yep. remember? Yep. Yeah, but, and they maybe did come back, but the, it, the reason, I mean, the utility company chose not to charge them and that they just didn't want the, and babies and, and it was a much nicer day i'm just yeah. saying yes, march 28th was a major snowstorm <laughs> there is footage and it's of later it. you know it's it's a whole year later so there is right. more awareness so then okay so that's in may then in july of that which would be again 1980 there's a third civil disobedience at the at the nuclear power plant and that was by kind of led by um, the, the previously mentioned provocateur, so this was more like a punk, this was more like a punk act. Um, and there were seven kind of like musician types, musician provocateurs, anybody who remembers the monoslobs or Pink Gravy, you're on the right track, okay. You're, you're on the right track. And what they did was um, they got in two canoes, they paddled down the Cedar River onto Dwayne Arnold property. <laughs> no. And there they were. Then they got out of the canoes and started just walking around and stuff. And then they, they were arrested too. They're, they were acquitted. They were, tr they were tried. Clemens Erdahl was one of their attorneys. And who's the other one? Oh, I can't think of it. Somebody who lives here in Iowa City still. Their, their trial was the first one that was actually filmed. Their whole trial was filmed and it's at the U of I Law School. <laughs> I did, I've not watched it. This is still another project that needs to be done. Um, but, but they were acquitted also then, and they actually were allowed to present testimony about the dangers of nuclear power in, in their trial. I'm um, trying to think who all was in that one. It would have been like, well, Kevin Barnard, S Scott Morgan again, yep. Um, probably Thomasine. Nope, but that's a good guess. <laughs> it, it's a likely guess. Oh, Paul, 
Bergman. Paul Bergman, maybe. Paul, there was another Paul, like Reller. Yeah, just in case anybody knows those names. Pardon? Maybe. So perhaps those, for those who keep up with the news, three or four months ago, they decide they're going to close the plant. Yeah. <laughs> the Twain <laughs> Arnold. <laughs> it's mostly an economic thing, as you can imagine, um, which, which was sort of what a lot of people thought was going to topple it anyhow. But you know, I mean, it's kind of has ebbed and flowed. I mean, after the 80s, just the number of plants coming online just plunged dramatically. Um, there were still some orders coming in, and there was still some support. But you know, we had Three Mile Island in 79. Then we had Chernobyl in 86. And so Americans are, were very skeptical of it. And the costs go up and up because of insurance and all these things that are going to have to be guaranteed. Uh, and then, then people kind of forgot about it and start thinking about coal is bad, coal is dirty, we don't like coal. So then we have like George W. and President Obama both thinking, well, nuclear. Let's get rid of coal. We have a little bit. Of, you know, let's let's go in that direction. Then we have Fukuyama uh, in Japan, and then Amer oh, okay, that's right. That is a bad idea. Um, and recently, you know, some of the companies that make the reactors have pulled away from it. GE and, and companies like that. So, kind of remains to be seen uh, what's going to happen. But I, I think they want to repurpose the Dwayne Arnold plant, maybe natural gas or something. I'm, I, I guess I'm not 100% sure what their plans are for it, but. <laughs> Those are the cultural factors that can influence a jury's decision. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs>